Forgive your brother when he trespasses and repents. When I tell people that nowhere in the Bible does it say repent of your sins to be saved, they might take me to Luke chapter 17 to try and refute me by pointing out where Jesus commanded his disciples to forgive a brother that trespasses against them if he repents. And quite reasonably so, most Christians would agree that this teaching applies to us as well, not just the disciples. So let's take a look at the passage. In Luke chapter 17 verses 3 to 4 it says, Take heed to yourselves, if your brother trespass against you, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to you, saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. So the context of repentance is very obvious here. Although this passage is about repenting of sin, we could argue that, strictly speaking, it's not really about salvation. Having said that, some people will elevate this to be about salvation, based on another passage. It says in Matthew 6, 14-15, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So that forgiveness there in Matthew 6 is interpreted to mean heavenly forgiveness, that is required to be saved. They will make it interchangeable with forgiveness and remission of sins that accompanies repentance in the book of Acts a couple of times, for example. But even if we made that connection, let's just say for the sake of argument, we join those two together. It's still not teaching repent of your sins for salvation in any case. Supposing that Luke 17 was a salvific requirement, it doesn't teach repent of your sins to be saved because it is not about you repenting. It is about forgiving a brother who has repented. Now, when it comes to various Bible passages about forgiveness, most people make the mistake of thinking that that only ever refers to forgiveness of all of your sins for the sake of salvation and everlasting life. But forgiveness can apply in other ways as well that aren't necessarily anything to do with salvation. Now, the King James Bible differs from other translations, such as the ESV and so on, in that uh, some verses actually use the word remission of sins rather than forgiveness of sins. Um, and it does that whenever those passages refer to an all-encompassing, one-time forgiveness of sins, such as repent and be baptised, as Peter said in Acts, um, even though it's the same Greek word that underpins those two words, whether it's forgiveness or remission. Now, we could debate until Judgment Day whether it's accurate for the King James Bible to translate the same Greek word into two different English words like that, but contextually it is quite helpful that when it's an obvious salvific kind of forgiveness, it translates it as remission, and in other more obscure verses it just translates it as forgiveness. Because forgiveness isn't always a one-time forgiveness of all sins for salvation, it can apply to just one-off instances of certain sins, and earthly specific circumstances as well. So for example, when Jesus was crucified and he prayed, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Okay, I don't think that anybody would take that verse and argue that everybody who crucified Jesus suddenly got saved because Jesus prayed that prayer over him. Obviously, it was a forgiveness only applying to a very, very specific sin, which was crucifying the Christ out of ignorance. But that doesn't address any other sins that they've ever committed. And there were also examples in the Old Testament, such as what's outlined in Second Chronicles 7, um, in that Solomon's prayer, where God would forgive sin and heal the land that was cursed by sin. But again, it, it wasn't evident that that's got anything to do with their eternal life, but it did apply to the earthly blessing of the nation of Israel. So forgiveness was specifically in that in that particular application. So we can't use Matthew 6 to indisputably assert that forgiving a brother in Luke 17 is a specific requirement for one's own salvation. Returning to the issue of repenting of sins, yes, this passage in Luke 17 is about repenting of sins. However, this passage does not support the repent of your sins so-called gospel message. Actually, it completely, utterly refutes it. Now, as kind of a small disclaimer, I should point out that this does depend on how exactly you define repent of your sins, because different people will define it in different ways. And that is another video for an, another day. But there are some people who will just say, well, it just means to be sorry for your sins, or, well, it's not enough to confess your sins, you actually have to turn from your sins, or you have to have a changed lifestyle. Well, Luke 17 completely refutes this idea, especially if we cross-reference it with Matthew 6. So in the Matthew 6 passage, we might assume that God is placing an expectation on us to forgive men 
and he will likewise forgive us. The logical understanding and conclusion here is that God is holding us to the same standard of forgiveness that he holds himself. God is not somehow holding us to a different standard to himself here. God is holding us to the same standard of forgiveness that he applies to himself. It stands to reason then, based on Matthew 6, that the standard by which we must forgive others is the same standard by which God will forgive us. It would be utterly absurd to expect God to hold flawed, sinful human beings to a higher standard of forgiveness than his perfect self. Why does that matter, you ask? Well, it's because of how repentance of a trespassing brother is defined in Luke 17, and the measuring line by which you are commanded to forgive your brother according to the specific standard of repenting of sins that he is accountable for. In Luke 17, verse 3, we are only commanded to forgive a brother if he repents, and this is assuming that you have rebuked him. But we are not told in this verse how his repentance must be made evident, i.e. does he just need to apologise or does he actually need to make restitution? We don't have such context here. Even after forgiveness is applied, according to verse 3, verse 4 then explains forgiveness for a brother that keeps sinning against you and it clarifies how your brother must evidence his repentance. He only has to say he repents even seven times in a day. Now this is where it gets interesting because a lot of these repent of your sins so-called gospel messengers usually say things like well it's not enough to feel sorry for your sins you can't just confess your sins that's not repentance there, in, there needs to be a change there needs to be evidence that you have correctly repented but all it says here is that the brother just needs to turn towards me or in our modern vernacular he just approaches me and say I repent that's all he has to do just say I repent even if it happens seven times in the same single day and so long as he says I repent I am commanded to forgive him all the same so this is amazing because there's so many things that we learn from just these two short verses to completely and utterly demolish the repent of your sins false gospel just these two little verses are so powerful and profound the first lesson that we learn here is that repentance, by which I mean of sins, only requires verbal confirmation. My brother does not have to get on his knees in sackcloth and ashes, weeping and appealing to me. My brother does not have to make restitution by agreeing a list of demands to make up for his sins against me. My brother does not have to make a vow that he will resolve to never do it again. He can even sin against me multiple times in a single day, and I have to forgive him. This teaches us that he does not even need to prove that his repentance is genuine with a changed lifestyle by not sinning against me any further. All he has to do is say that he repents. This is literally the only evidence I have that he repents. He just turns to me and tells me I repent. In our modern vernacular, this might be like a simple verbal apology. The second lesson that we learn is that your brother may sin against you multiple times in a single day. Now, most Christians would agree that brother means brother in the faith, not particularly a blood relative. Repentance preachers tell you that you have to turn from sins to be saved. So logically, you have to turn from sin to be adopted into the family of God and counted among the brethren. But if both my brother and I turned from our sins to be saved, hence why we are now brothers in the first place, then he should not be sinning against me seven times in one day. He should have repented of his sins and showed his repentance with a changed life. If he keeps sinning against me and his repentance is not genuine, how is he then my brother? Notice that Jesus said day, not week or year. A brother in Christ who is justified, sanctified, saved and sealed in the name of the Lord Jesus might sin against you seven times in a single day. Let that sink in. The third lesson that we learn is that I am commanded to forgive my brother just because he said, I repent. My brother does not have to prove that his repentance is genuine and bring forth works meet for repentance. He doesn't have to demonstrate a change lifestyle or attitude towards me. He doesn't evidently have to make any restitution necessarily. All he has to do is say he repents. That's it. That is the standard on requirement to obtain my forgiveness. So these three lessons teach us just how absurd and how ridiculous the repent of your sins gospel message really is. Think about this. If it is not enough to say sorry for our sins, 
Why does my brother only have to say that he repents? Why doesn't he have to prove his repentance is genuine before I forgive him? If we had to repent of sins to become brothers in Christ, why is he sinning against me seven times in one day? And here is the big question. Why does God expect me to forgive my brother seven times in a single day just because he says he repents, but I must genuinely repent of my sins for God to forgive me? If it is not enough to confess sins or apologise for sinning for God's forgiveness, why would God have higher expectations of a fallen sinful man than for his own holy self? Well, the answer is simple. It's because the whole repent of your sins gospel is a fraud. It's The whole thing is complete nonsense. And it's so nonsensical that even two small verses that are actually about repenting of sin completely demolish this doctrine. It's completely and utterly false. This is no-nonsense Christianity reminding you that nowhere in the Bible does it say repent of your sins to be saved.